you know, when you put effort into it, people making it aware that it exists, whether it be Facebook can, you know, retargeting on, on Facebook ads or, or an email drop with, you know, 10% off or, or, or something, then yeah, they, they move. But, um, but again, it's effort. You, you're, you're selling your products. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a money-making business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Mike Dion, man. How you doing, Mike? Doing good. Thank you. Good, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I, uh, our, our, uh, our mutual friend, Kia uh, Kiso, uh, who's also a friend of the show, been on the show as well, um, she has been talking about you for as long as I've known her. She's like, you and Mike have to get together. You guys think alike. You got to do all this stuff. And you and I have been so busy. We've been just going back and forth trying to figure out times for us to actually do this. So we finally did this. And when I started to dig in deep into what you're doing, man, you are the personification of my book come to life. It is, it is you, it's like you, you got my copy of Rise of the Film Entrepreneur and went back in time. And like, I'm going to do this before anybody does. Like you were doing Everything I talk about in Rise of the Film Entrepreneur years ago, almost a decade now ago, um, when it wasn't cool and it wasn't the thing to do and self-distribution was like, are you insane? What are you doing? You were building up this, 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 this mini empire business that you've built over the years and I was just so blown away. So I, I needed to bring you on the show so you can share uh, all your secrets on... <laughs> on how you do this so other filmmakers can follow your path. So before we get started, man, how did you uh, get into the business? I actually went to film school back in the day in, a, in an amazing film school at State University. You know, I'm sure we've all heard of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was uh, started off there, graduated in the early 90s. And luckily enough, there were some films uh, being shot in Montana the year that I graduated, far and away, a river runs through it. And luckily enough, uh, professor Vars got us on set for for these you know crazy crazy ass films getting to hang out with ron howard and tom cruise and brad pitt and, and robert redford but i think interestingly enough you know kind of having this chip on your on your shoulder it's like i should be directing these films i shouldn't be like charging walkie talkie batteries for you know for ron oh. howard's assistant oh. you know oh so, i would be a film student oh. oh my god yeah i look back <laughs> on that i'm going you silly child so but i think what was interesting about that is i almost got you know it's like this was too big this hollywood stuff was 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 too big so it almost kind of made it okay then to go get a job with a, a local um video production company and start doing commercials and shooting and producing and editing and everything else so that's kind of where it all started way back in the day now you um the the movie that kind of launched you into this this film entrepreneurial business model if i may if i may coin my own word um was ride the divide now Ride the Divide, um, please tell people what Ride the Divide is and, and who, who is it aimed at as far as an audience is concerned. Sure thing. Uh, Ride the Divide is a feature-length documentary film that covered an inaugural mountain bike race from Canada to Mexico, and it was centered on this cycling, ultra-endurance cycling, bikepacking. And back in the day, this was kind of a, a very under-the-radar event. It's the antithesis to things like the Tour de France um, it's the opposite of that, where it's all self-supported, there's no teams, and it wasn't really directed at anybody. It was one of those pure passion projects where here's this crazy event, we should capture it to the best of our ability um, and then see what happens to it. And, you know, what could have, you know, just been a YouTube video with some effort in the editing and the packaging actually became a, a real film that, um, you know, went on to do great things. So... So take me through the process because there was no rise of the film entrepreneur. There was no education. There's no information about what you're doing uh, like there is today. So how did you come to understand like, okay, well, we've made this movie. Obviously, our audience is – one of our audiences is bikers and people who like to mountain bike and who are bike enthusiasts and cycle, cycle enthusiasts. How did you begin to – put everything together like wait a minute let's target these people and how did you target it in 2000 was it 2010 2010 early 2010 is when so it, uh, so my released. so myspace myspace was all the rage 
Um, yeah. <laughs> so there was yeah. no there was no Facebook ads yet. There I, was was there no ads. Facebook was Facebook existed yeah, and Twitter sure. existed, but yeah, there was we're spending money on ads then. Right, exactly. So there was no targeting like you could do now to find an audience and target and all that stuff. It was it was a lot more difficult back then. So it how was, did you yeah. so how did you start figuring this out? I think the mindset came. The film got into the Vale Film Festival and it you know, actually won Best Adventure Film at the Vale Film Festival. And we packed the screening through our own efforts of putting the word out there. It's like, hey, our film is finally done. Come see it. So people traveled to Vale to, to come watch the film. And, and we sold out. There were people standing in the back of the room watching this film. And, and in my mind, it's it was like, the Vale Film Festival is collecting all the ticket sales from this and we're not getting anything. We're not Correct. collecting any of this. So so that gave me almost it's like, well, shit, I'm going to start booking my own my own theaters. And one thing that, you know, being that it is sports, there was a, a ski film director, Warren Miller. I don't know if you ever heard of Warren Miller ski films, but he's been around forever. And I remember being a kid going and watching Warren Miller ski films in auditoriums and, and things like that. So so he kind of had this model where take a film on tour, you know, book it, book a, an auditorium or a theater, sell tickets to the passionate skiers and and kind of have prizes and giveaways and, and, and you know, have a have a good time. So that, you know, having that at, at, as a kid, but then wanting to it's like, you know, monetize, collect my own ticket sales. Well, that kind of started it off. And then, you know, we booked the the Boulder Theater in Boulder, Colorado, which was 860 seat theater. And we sold 550 tickets and, and had Gregory Allen Isakoff perform, you know, music who was from Boulder and also had some sound uh, songs in the film itself. So that was the beginning of what kind of kicked off. It's like, I'm taking control of this thing. Yeah, because you um, uh, did you even try to go down the, the traditional distribution route? Yeah, most definitely. So we did um, get the film signed with New Video, uh, which in an mm. aggregator, which then got bought out and became Cinedime. So Cinedime did get us into iTunes and and did get us a, a tiny Netflix deal, super freaking tiny Netflix deal, and it you know got us into the the digital platforms. But then you know we also you know, we're continuing the path of, of um, putting on our own events, um, putting our own DVDs up on Amazon and, and you know, direct-to-consumer type mentality of, of sales. So, oh, yes, yeah, because, I mean, so, so that was your first experience, but did you did you get, like, I don't say the word screwed, but it wasn't, it wasn't a distributor, it was an aggregator you were dealing with mostly? Yeah, well, yep, so we, no, they treated us pretty good for... Okay. for you know, up until about year six or so, payments kind of stopped for a while. I think as as they kind of transitioned from new video to Cinedime, payments stopped. But but um, and there was a good year and a half where payments didn't happen. But then they started making good on on things. So um, I haven't been royally screwed, knock on wood, by by anybody yet. But you know, we haven't really kind of gone down the path of, of you know, I can recognize a, a shady situation perhaps and, and, you know, having enough belief in myself. It's like, no, I don't need you. This doesn't feel right. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm not going to choose you. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Now you say that you put the word out. How did you actually start cultivating this audience? Yeah. Fa I think Facebook was, you know, it was early, it was early on and, and Facebook and, and actually Twitter, we were using, using Twitter. But then as we would put on our own sort of theatrical screening events, we tried to the best of our ability to connect with local, you know, bike shops and advocacy groups and, and partners in, in each city that did have potentially newsletter lists and email lists and, and, their own fan bases. So, so definitely as much partnership mentality as, as we could do to help spread the word. And then even forums, you know, thinking back. Oh to, yeah. You know, oh no. Forums I... were, were a thing. Message so, boards, uh, message boards, message oh, yeah. boards. Absolutely. So it was, it was everything and everything just kind of taking on that, that mentality of, of a PR um, type person. But you were going after cyclists and fans. Absolutely. And that, that's that's who. So you're going to message boards about cycling and bicycle enthusiasts and anything dealing with that that niche, if you will, that kind of audience. Um, Absolutely. And and just starting to pound them as much as you could. Um, uh, that's something I was doing in 2005 with a little short film 
that was aimed at independent filmmakers to teach them how to make a, a low budget independent film. Um, and I did it instinctively, kind of like you. I was just like, just kind of figuring it out. I'm like, wait a minute, the audience is here. I've got a product for them. Maybe I should connect these guys. These are my people. How do I present what I just created to my people? Right, exactly. And that's that's amazing. So, so you start building it up. Did you start figuring out email yet at this point? As far as grabbing email lists and how important is an email list to you in, in your business model now? Huge, massive. Email list is freaking massive. And so we did cobble together a WordPress website wow. and we did start collecting emails from there and then did get um, sort of a merchant sort of aspect onto this cobbled together uh, WordPress a merchant website. Account. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and it was e oh, early on. E Junkie. Oh, oh, you did. Oh, you use eJunkie. I use eJunkie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 eJunkie. So eJunkie was oh. kind of how was the the merchant piece to this cobbled together <laughs> uh, WordPress site, and and yeah, we kind of put that together. And then what was interesting, we finished the website, and then I think put you know put a link on 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 Facebook or something, and woke up the next next morning, and there was like seven DVD sales, and it's like isn't that the best? Right, isn't that amazing? We're onto something. Isn't here. isn't that the most amazing feeling? Yes. Like yeah. when I when I did that for the first time when I launched because I've been talking to my I was talking to my audience for months and they had trailers and people were like excited about this DVD and the second I hit send on that email like it was like I don't know to maybe like a th 500 people I collected over the over whatever and I did it manually <laughs> there was no email service it was just like a manually sending it out to people back in the day DCC. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden I would just hear PayPal emails ding 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 it was just the best but then you had to fulfill it and that was that <laughs> oh my god dude it's like i still i fulfilled everything out of out of my out of this freaking house for the last 10 years it's you know our garage has been filled with with boxes at at times um but but you know that's that's the game I don't know. it's, it's the and game. that is the game and and you know in because i'm fulfilling everything i also get on a postcard to write a little thank you note, you know, John, thank you, exclamation mark, Mike Dion, put it in the package. So, you know, 98% of everything I've shipped out of here, people have got a little, you know, signed thank you card for me, you know, over the last 10 years. So it's that, I think it's that kind of mentality and strategy and thinking and caring about an audience. If someone's going to go through the effort of whipping out a credit card and sending you, you know, money, how, should we not be appreciative for that? <laughs> No, absolutely. Absolutely. Because a lot of times, you know, filmmakers a lot of times think of it as almost transactional and it's not really grassroots. It's not really building a community. And it's because, look, it's daunting to build a community. It's daunting and it's it's time consuming. You know this as well as I do. It takes years to build a passionate community. You have to provide a tremendous amount of value. You have to give them what they're looking for. It takes time. It takes time. But but I think you could attest to this. Once that audience is built and that relationship is solid, you can build upon that and continue to make new products and new right. films. And that's what you've kind of done. Yeah, it's it's to use e-commerce type and, you know, it's customer lifetime value. <laughs> so by putting in the effort of building a customer um, and or a fan, you've now then you know, have this customer lifetime value where if you do then have a new project and you want to send an email list, hey, here's my next Kickstarter, you, you hit send and within 10 days, there's $25,000, you know, right? Because in an account because of, you know, of that effort that you just said you put into, into that audience building. And then also you were doing films in this niche because you just truly love this niche. Like you didn't right. do this like all oh, the money's in biking movies. Like, <laughs> no, it's not like we should, you know, horror films are doing pretty good. Let's go make a horror film. It's like no one ever said there's great money in bikepacking films. Let's go make a bikepacking <laughs> documentary. Said no one ever. <laughs> right. But but once you figured out, but this is something you truly enjoy and, and you've been able to figure out how to monetize this for not just a year or two or not for one or one project or two. You've built an essentially a business, a full blown business around this, right? Yeah. And when you say monetize, it's. You know, it's it's really just creating products for these particular people and then making the products available. 
to them. And and the products just happen to be a, a film, a T-shirt, a poster, an experience, um, a, a how-to piece of, of content. So, you know, I think we go into too much strategy of, of uh, you know, what – you know, what's the hot commodity <laughs> right now? It's it's like, no, if you were to go create a product, what would the product be that that you enjoy putting out to your audience? And that and that's the thing that filmmakers don't get is like they'll they'll just because it's art and I get it. Sometimes it's art, but if art it's an expensive art form. So if you're gonna do something that's expensive, you really need to fit or that's gonna take a year of your life. If you wanna get paid for that in some way, shape, or form, even if it is art. You really need to go, who's going to watch this? And that question is rarely asked, I find, with independent films. In general, they're like, who is this targeting? Who is this aimed at? Who's going to watch this? Yeah, I, you know, to, if, I often think of this like as a startup. You know, let's yeah. just, you know, like to have a startup mentality, I'm going to go create a SaaS product or I'm going to go, you know, create some consumer, you know, packaged good, <laughs> you know, I, I almost kind of take on the thought process of I'm going to go, I'm creating, you know, if this is a startup, if, if this film is, is a startup, exactly to your point, who's the audience? How is it packaged? How are we, you know, what's the, what's the sales mechanism, you know, for this? How are we going to continue to create customers for, for this particular product? You know, I think from films, we get into this release, launch, work for three months, and then it kind of dies. But if you've got a nutrition bar, if that's your product, are you going to market that for three months? And then it's like, well, that was, you know, the end of my <laughs> promotion for this awesome nutrition bar I just made. No, you're going to continue daily, weekly basis for years upon years upon years marketing your product. So yeah, and that's the thing that that films you're, you're right because films that like they, they think there's a shelf a shelf life. A lot of times films, and sometimes they might there might be a shelf life. Like oh, that came out in 2019. I can't watch that. If the if the if the pandemic has taught us anything, I've gone back to movies I watched there 2001, 2002. I've gone back and watched old series that I don't remember anymore, and started watching those again. It's it, it, there is no shelf life. And, and by the way, ask any of the studios. If there's a shelf life to their to their libraries, are you kidding me? You know, I mean, Spielberg still makes five million a year. He said, I think I heard somewhere five million a year off of Jaws residuals. I, I, <laughs> I, I get it. But it's a great story is going to have a shelf life forever. And I'm not sure if you're familiar. I don't read a whole lot of books, but there's a book Perennial Seller by Ryan Holiday. Oh, I know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I know Ryan yeah, Holiday. So, yeah, he's excellent. So perennial seller is is the idea of if you're going to put the time and energy into creating a piece of art, whether it happens to be a painting or a book or a film or or music, put in the extra energy and effort to make it a story that's got staying power, that you're going to surprise and delight the world with this piece of art that you put all this extra thought and, and energy into. And because it now does rise above and, and has potential staying power, it becomes something that you can continue to market to 7 billion people in the world. No one's ever going to, you know, fully know your piece of art. So on it, you can continue to market it for your entire life and still not reach every potential person who could appreciate watching it or seeing it or hearing it. Right. And if, if you can figure out a way to automate that process, um, like with the because the website's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 a year. So it's not like you have a lemonade stand that you have to close up after a certain time. If you figure out a way to automate that, meaning like you put out content into the world that they click on and like, oh, oh, there's this or I watched this video. Oh, look, there's a link to the movie. If you're able to automate that, that is that's where that's when you start really getting into passive income and really start building that stuff. I've built my entire business around that. Like my, I've built this universe of indie film hustle and bulletproof screenwriting and all these other companies around this, this model of this ecosystem that I've created. And it's constantly working for me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And not only am I'm being able to get money from it, but I'm helping people. I'm, I'm educating people. I'm helping them on their journeys. My books, and I'm assuming the same thing with your movies. Um, they just, they just, every day I check, there's someone bought a book. 
So, somewhere in the world, someone bought a book. It's an audiobook, ebook, every, and it's constant. And when I got into the book, book publishing game with my first two books, oh man, I was just like, wow, this is, this is awesome. It just, and books are one of those things that they just go. Books just, you could find a book from 20 years ago. And if it's, as long as it's still relevant information, I mean, look, uh, what is it, Napoleon Hill? Um, you know, I mean, Jesus, you know, I mean, those kind of, those kind of self-help books and things, they just go on and on and on. So uh, yeah. do, do you, do you have that same kind of? Yeah, absolutely. But you say automation, but I wouldn't, you know, let people think automation is easy, right? So no. it becomes, it's, it is easy after the fact, but yes. once you've put the time and energy in creating the gears of the machine that once built then become a flywheel that have continued motion. So, you know, what does automation look like? It's website, it's SEO, it's putting out YouTube videos and with articles. SEO and content and links. And it is building Facebook content, Instagram content, and it is putting email automations in place when people do. So, but once you've put that system in place, then yes, it does have automatic <gasps> Yes, situation but, to it, but it takes a while. It takes it years sometimes yeah. to put that together. But that's strategy, right? But if you've got huh. that mentality back again, this is my startup. This is my product. This is my sales mechanism that I'm mm -hmm. putting in place. And then once it's in place, eighty percent of it is automation. And now the twenty percent that you're kind of putting, continuing to feed the machine on a daily or, or weekly basis becomes easier. <laughs> right. And like what you, you've done because you had Ride the Divide, but then to continue to feed that beast, you you did Inspire to Ride. You did Reveal the Path, which were all like, um, not sequels, but they definitely all go together in a nice package, which of course you sure. could sell as a as a package. Uh, <laughs> but that but you kept feeding that beast over the years um, as well as we'll get into the, all the product lines and other things that you were built out. But just on the movie standpoint, you kept feeding into this audience and you kept giving them new, fresh content, right? Correct. Yep. That, that's right. So for, for a good, the f from 2010 to about 2017, 2018, it was, it was exactly as you just described. That was a full, the full-time job really, um, putting out, you know, films and, and content and marketing. And then, you know, 2018 or so, one of the main characters in my film inspired to ride was killed in a, in a cycling oh. event. And that, that only put through me back, but you know, kind of the whole community. So that put a, a wrench in things for a few years and it kind of reassessed, um, uh, some things and did a lot more of sort of freelance work and contract work. So, but you know, now it's kind of coming back into, uh, into the swing of things again. And, you know, with new ideas, so right, exactly. But still for but, this audience, but new distribution media company type ideas. That's that's excellent. Now, when you were when you were releasing your films, did you do a theatrical or self theatrical runs on this stuff? Yes, every single one. And we, when the films first came out, we would do a good foot twenty to thirty city tour uh, with with the film, mostly mostly in the in the western states i'm in colorado and you know a lot of cyclists between the rocky mountains and, and west so so i'd go kind of hit a theatrical tour for six weeks or so and then kind of made it available where bike shops and other entities could put on their own theatrical screenings and then almost hired a um a tour promoter to kind of put on on shows and stuff like that. We kind of a little secret weapon with that. So now did you, did you do, um, four walling or did you actually get booked? The, the bulk of the, the bulk of it was four walling. Yep. And then there was some split ticket sale splits, um, happening as well. But the bulk of it was, um, was four walling. Yep. Okay. And then, and did you sell products at those screenings? Most definitely. That was, <laughs> that was key. So definitely merch table set up, uh, DVDs, posters, um, T-shirts, um, all set up with the merch table signing, signing posters, and um, and then also to the best of our ability, collecting collecting email addresses. If we were selling our own tickets through something like, you know, brown paper tickets or or right. um, Eventbrite or something like that, well, we then had the email address, and I even kind of for for the last film when it was out there, I actually kind of had a a little preview 
that was me welping, welcoming people to to the screening event and saying, hey, whip out your cell phone uh, right now. I know which is weird because, yes. you know, it's dark and, and no one should, you know, whip out their phone. But, hey, I want you to text, you know, the word inspired film to, I forget what the number was, 444-222. And, and you'll, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to select some winners from that. So, you know, that actually was a killer strategy because then, you know, not only did I get people's phone numbers, but then they entered their email address um, within this. And then as the film went on to some some film festivals and then I mentioned we kind of had a tour um, promoter that kind of took the film out on his own. So I'd be sitting at home and all of a sudden my phone would just like go off with, you know, 60 text messages you know, when he had the film out there and then, you know, that that played. And then and then I waited about 85, uh, like 90 minutes until the film was done. And then I started texting people back. Hey, this is Mike, the director. Did you hope you enjoyed the film? And people would lose their minds. It's like, dude, that was awesome. I loved it. Thank you. So I know, wow. just unique strategies, right? You know, having fun with with this whole game. <laughs> now, did you and you talked a little bit about hosting your own screenings. How did you do well with those host your own screenings? Some of them would would break even. Some of them, you know, made thousands. Some of them made hundreds. Some of them lost a hundred dollars. But, but what I, you know, the goodwill and, a, you know, creating a fan and having that face to face um, communication, and then having them potentially go tell a few people, and then if we do, you know, again, your earlier question about an email list. Well, now I have an, you know. To be able to, if I lost money, I now have 70 emails that over the next five years, I likely generated thousands and thousands of dollars from those 70 people who showed up up, up at, a, at a screening earlier on. So, so that's kind of how I see that. So, yeah, when you, yeah, if you get 70 people to come up to a screening up for a documentary about bike riding, um, they're pretty passionate, targeted people. They are more than likely the, the percentage, I'd imagine, of them purchasing another product or watching another movie or renting something else you did. or any, It's very high because that's a hot And that was on the low end. I'd say 70 was the, you know, between 70 and 250 is mm -hmm. generally the screenings um, were. And, and that's, that's worth the price of admission. If you broke even, you're winning. If you lose 100 bucks, you're winning, you know, unless it was. If like a, you've got that lifetime value infrastructure. Mentality. It, it also infrastructure in place. Yeah. If you have if you have the infrastructure in place to take advantage of the, that kind of opportunity to to better serve that that potential customer, um, all the better. Ab absolutely. Now, I was always wondering about those host the screening things, but um, and I also saw that you sold credits uh, to your film. Uh, yeah. A little bit here yeah, and there I for like twenty five bucks or something like that, which is yeah. You want your name in the movie credits? Twenty five bucks. It was like. <laughs> Did that do anything? Did you make any money with that? So we, so it, let's see, for the kick, Inspired to Ride, Inspired to Ride's Kickstarter, we did that. And then with this new thing we're doing now, you know, as we're editing this new thing, we're, I've kind of got a founding member sort of thing happening where, yeah, you do get your name in the credits and, and you get to win the actual camera that shot the original Ride the Divide. And we haven't talked about what RTD 10 is, but, I think if you do it in in a cool way, then then yes, I think it's it's um, it's cool. <laughs> it's a it's a cool thing, but it's also it, it builds your community, it builds the audience, it builds the niche, um, and you're connecting with them. It, like they really are invested in you because now my name is on that movie, so now you've created a much more even passionate, um, right. Especially, you know, knowing that these films are on iTunes and, and these bigger platforms. Well, then it becomes bragging rights. It's like, dude, come over. We'll watch this. You'll see my name go by in the in the, in the credit roll. The, 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 I think as filmmakers, we forget the power of a credit because we you know, like we could just type in our own names because we made the movie. So it's not that big of a deal for us. But for 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 as they, we like to call them normies, because um, <laughs> we're car Mike, we're carnival folk. We're carnival folk. Yeah. Let's oh, just yeah. we are carnival folk. There's no question about it. Um, so, but Carney and the Cardis, the normies, they would lose their mind. They're like, oh my god! If they imagine being in a in a theater and seeing your name pop up for the first time, oh my god, that would be massive. So, yeah. and if you sell them for twenty five bucks a pop, why not? 
it's like or whatever the, the price is but still it's a great great strategy yeah and and there's sort of packages where yeah and as we're kind of working on this rtd 10 it's you could also you know with the movie poster we're creating a new movie poster. you know again selling an, an associate producer or a producer credit which you know, so many, how many producers, you know, buy their way into the credits anyway, so. Well, there's that, yeah, too. So, yeah, there's, you know, I've, you know, when I was making films, uh, sometimes you'll see, like, six, seven executive producers uh, or produced by credits because they, like, well, he gave me the grip truck. And, you know, he oh, they, he brought the cameras, so I didn't have to pay for that for the shoot. So, you know, you do what you got to do at the beginning. Like, when you're coming up, you just do, you know, you do whatever you can. And sometimes it's still even as you're going. You know, if you can sell an executive producer credit for five grand, that's that takes me two minutes. That's <laughs> that's that, that make that's more than any attorney on the planet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's again if if you look at this as as a game, you know, a carny game, right, or, or or whatever, it's you know, it's, you you get. You know, hey, step right up. <laughs> do what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, and look, as, as filmmakers, we all got to hustle and, and do whatever we can. But at the end of the day, we're providing that person who buys a credit experience and, and bragging rights and an IMDb credit. And th there's value to that. And uh, I, I remember I sold, I bought, I think originally I might have, when I was first starting, I might have bought like an, an associate producer credit for like 20 bucks. I was like, Yes, I have an IMDb credit. That's awesome. But everybody that was like 2000 or 96, I think it was, or 97 or whatever it was when I did it. But um, but yeah, it, it's it's a thrill, when, especially when you're just starting out or you just want that that little shiny executive producer credit um, mm -hmm. on there as well. And there's different packages too. You can sell like premiere tickets and other things like that as well, correct? Yeah, exactly. So it's it's, again, how can you surprise and delight your audience with – whether it be a credit or a unique piece piece of merchandise or, or a bundle or a signed movie poster or, or whatever. So again, it's I utilize the indie uh, music industry, you know, as, as a lot, you know, from, mm -hmm. from an examples. And I kind of steal, I, I'm kind of like a sponge. It's like, what industry can I steal ideas from that work with what I'm kind of doing at, at the moment? And um, you know, I think, you know, traveling musicians, putting on tours and selling merchandise and, and putting bundles together and packages together. So I think as much as we can look out into other industries, and I, like I, you know, mentioned, you know, software as a service, you know, like what ideas can you get from the SaaS startup company that you could utilize as, as a filmmaker and strategy and marketing? So be open to getting outside of this little bubble of like, I hope I get into a film festival and someone discovers me. It's like, screw that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've got it in, in today's world is because it's so much harder to make. I mean, even when you were starting out in 2010 and when I was coming up in 2005 with selling stuff, it was easier to make money. Like, you know, I sold thousands of DVDs back then. Um, now it's so much harder to generate revenue because the audience is more, there's so much more competition uh, these platforms are taking a whole bunch of, we'll get into the platforms in a minute, um, but it's just harder. The more you can control multiple revenue streams outside of the standard distribution model, which is what you've done, the better you, because if sales go down to the DVD, but the t-shirts are killing it because they just happen to be really cool t-shirts, all, hey, all the better. And what's to say, you know, three years later, you can't drop a new t-shirt just like a band would, you know, here's our new you know, designs, here's three new designs. And then you even go to Facebook and Instagram. It's like, hey, here's five concepts. Pick, you know, what, which are your favorite? And then it becomes community engagement. And then, you know, your audience picked the two winners. And now you go produce those and you're documenting that whole process. You're in the in the ink printing, you know, facility, videotaping them, making it. They're now available you know, or and then throughout that whole process, you've got them for sale for pre-order up on the website. So you've already probably maybe sold four or five thousand dollars as they're being made. And then once they're made, then you're documenting the shipping out, which generates just more buzz and more interest. So, M Mike, you're talking dirty to me. Stop it. Just stop <laughs> it. Stop it. Pre-orders, packing. Stop it. It's just just dirty talk, sir. Uh, <laughs> it's so wonderful to talk to someone who gets it. Like it's, it's, it's just such a wonderful experience. I'm assuming it's the same for you because you, there's not many people you can actually have a conversation about this with. This is, I, this is, you know, like people say, are you a passionate filmmaker? I, 
I appreciate the art and the steps of yeah we documentary filmmakers we wear, we wear a lot of the hats we're shooting we're editing we're we're everything else but the strategy of of and marketing dude that to your point it's like oh, oh stop talking you know that <laughs> that's exciting to me it's like I don't know. Let's try it. Let's see if it works. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and that's what I always gets me excited as well. I, I mean, I'm an art, I'm an artist. I'm a filmmaker. I love doing that, but I also love the business side. I also love the marketing side. I also love being able to think about how to put it all together. And to me, that gets me really, really excited. Um, it, most filmmakers just like I just want to make a movie, right? But it's but like dude, that 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 marketing stuff is dirty. I'm a director. I just want to direct. I just want to go from film to film and direct. And that's awesome. That's great. Um, if you, if you could do it and, and I can promise you that's, that's 2% of the entire industry that gets to do that as like, like just go and direct and not think about anything else. And someone else handles it. Those days are, 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 are gone. And there's a small, maybe two to 5% of all directors trying to direct the movie in the world, get that privilege. Um, and, and I've spoken to many of those directors on the show who have this and even they, and I promise you, Mike, every, every, the bigger the guy or gal that I talk to, they all still have to hustle to get the next project. It's so fascinating. You know, we were t- talking to somebody the other day and we were talking about Spielberg. And I'm like, yeah, Spielberg couldn't get money for Lincoln. He had to go hustle his money for Lincoln. Scorsese couldn't get silence made. He tried 20 years and he had to go hustle money from India to make it happen. Now he's hustling Netflix, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Netflix just keeps giving him up $200 million to de-age Robert De Niro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. But but that's the thing. They always have to hustle and, and it never stops. It never stops for anybody, no matter who you are. You still got to go do it. But at, at the level that we're talking about, which is the indie level, you definitely can't hustle uh, you, you can't stop that hustle no you know question. business is business you know what company do you have you ever worked for or or know out there that you don't have to put in an eight hour day or you know what even if you have a regular corporate job you're still working eight hours a day what it just you know as indie filmmakers it's like we're just doing we're still putting in eight to ten to twelve hour days of work right so exactly exactly now how big a part did I know I'm assuming before physical media was you know DVDs and Blu-rays and that that was a much bigger deal four or five years ago. What part does it play still to this day? What I haven't put out a whole lot like a, a new film in you know in the last three years. So you know I don't have what a new product would do, but I just you know from a you know from a library of stuff, absolutely DVDs have, have dropped off. However, you know, DVDs are still selling on a weekly basis from our, um, we've, I've now kind of moved from WordPress to Shopify. So Shopify site is kind of our main, um, platform now and then Amazon, but, um, absolutely dropped off, but you know, they're still selling on, on a weekly basis, physical items like, you know, t-shirts and, and bundles, you know, do well as they're marketed, you know, just from the, kind of set it and forget it standpoint you know when you put effort into it people making it aware that it exists whether it be facebook can you know retargeting on on facebook ads or or an email drop with you know 10 percent off or, or or something then yeah they they move but um but again it's effort you you're you're selling your products Right, exactly. And uh, yeah, physical products, I know, depending on the physical product, will still do well. Um, and DVD, uh, people keep saying, oh, it's dead. It's not dead. It's not dead. It's still making money, man. I know guys are making a lot of money, but it depends on the niche. depends sure. on who it is, where it is. Some places in the world, still, DVD is the thing still. Um, you know, Netflix still sell still does the the dvd by mail thing nobody they likes it really? oh yeah they don't like to talk about it but it is still a thing red box is huge i still still you know outside of front of my grocery store i still still i see people in front of the red box yeah so 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 it's still it's still going um and if you could get a red box deal oh my god those things are so oh uh, we could talk offline i could tell you the numbers oh my god it's yeah. it's insane insane I, Best distribution deal on the planet right now, if you yeah. could get it, if, a, a good red box deal. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, like I saw some like special wood covered uh, DVD editions and things like that. That you are selling for a premium, like at fifty bones. But that's something that the collector wants. 
Right. Right. Yeah, that goes back to Ride the Divide. We did put a bundle together. We, yeah, it was a wood a wood box with a laser engraved um, sort of top. And then inside was a, a book and a T-shirt. And, dude, this goes – yeah, you did some you did some homework. Hey, man. This goes back quite a few – Yeah. Quite a few years. So – and we did – um, we did sort of a live thing with, with a fan, you know, a few weeks ago and, and he was, you know, there kind of, you know, talking and on his, on his bookshelf behind him was one of those boxes, like from 2010. I'm like, holy crap, dude, you saved that. He's like, no, dude, it's of course. <laughs> it's a wooden, it's a wooden case for a DVD. What am I going to do? Throw it away? <laughs> And I'll walk into bike shops and, and whatnot, and there's, you know, one of my posters, you know, sitting up in a corner somewhere, you know, in, in a bike shop. And, you know, we've, gosh, we've shipped out probably 6,000 posters over the last 10 years between all the films. Yeah. And that's, and that's, that's, a, I'm assuming a good profit margin on those things. Uh, some of them were, were profit, and then some of them just happened to be, you know, as we, like you mentioned earlier, when we went into a city for a theatrical event, I, you know, I sent posters to all of the bike shops in in that particular city with, with a letter and, and everything else just to, you know, build buzz and, and everything else. So it's and then with with some Kickstarter campaigns and bundles and, and things like that. You know, any, yeah, the, any posters. <laughs> right, and the thing is too, like thinking about it, because I've been in bike shops. I have, I have a bike. I'm not anywhere near what you guys do, but I, I ride. Uh, not the divide. I just ride. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, that hobby is expensive, and and bike riders spend money. Like it's not just buying a two hundred dollar bike. You're talking about I've seen bikes at six seven thousand dollars. It's like, right. and they and 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 they're very passionate about riding, so they will spend money. So as a niche audience, to provide products for, uh, this is not a bad one to pick. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right, and and it is interesting. So we, I helped produce a, another documentary called Hair I Go Again, which was sort of about you know kind of like where where are they now from an eighties you know, hair, hair metal band. And, um, and what was interesting is like, I think I got spoiled exactly what you just described. Here's this middle-class upper middle-class demographic with, with cycling. And then we were pushing out this hair. I go again, documentary with, you know, a different sort of niche and, and man, it just, it didn't, it did okay, but man, it wasn't doing what I got, what I got spoiled, <laughs> you know, doing with, with the cycling projects. Right. And people always ask me like, how do you make money with independent filmmakers? Everyone's broke. I'm like, well, you know, it's just about providing a service and things like that. But a lot of people come into the game trying to, to try to just grab money and try to take advantage of filmmakers and things like that. And I feel that filmmakers are the most abused demographic oh. Uh, of of an audience ever and it starts with film school <laughs> like it starts with starts with paying obscene amounts of money for film school which you're not going to get an roi on for a decade if you're one of the lucky ones that can actually make a career out of it uh, in film school so it's i feel that they're just constantly being abused and abused Gosh, and abused and, and then even like the film festival it's like oh the, the, it's the please choose me industry it's like please choose me please choose me it's like yeah we we've we've been oh yeah no, we, that's it, a it, whole other topic. Right, and it, the, the whole please choose me, and I think what you've been doing for for a long time, and what I talk about in my book, and what I've been doing a long time, is to take control. Stop asking for permission. Start building out your own system. Start building out your own infrastructure, so you can make a living doing this. Can I get an amen? <laughs> preach, brother, preach. <laughs> Now, um, so I see that you use you use Vimeo and it was VHX prior to that before Vimeo bought them for sales of of your own TVOD. Do you and, and I saw that if I was making it wrong, some of them are on iTunes or all of them are on iTunes and all the major TVOD platforms as well. Correct. Yeah, and, and you know, even though yeah, as you know, I put as much effort into as much as I can control, I then, you know, as many places as I can get it from a traditional standpoint with iTunes and Amazon on demand and things like that. Absolutely. And, you know, I know people are like, what's the best platform for my film? It's like, there isn't a best platform. It's like any platform you can get on is the right platform to be on. So if you can drive traffic, it's, it's, of course. it's, it's, it's all about driving traffic. And but I was going to ask you, what part is TVOD doing well for you? Because I've been saying for a while now that TVOD 
unless you can drive traffic, is pretty much dead for the independent filmmaker. If you could drive traffic, there's still some hope. But people's they've just stopped. And I know probably back when these were released, TVOD was still a thing. People were still renting, but they don't rent as much anymore because everyone's just got used to that whole subscription model. Like I, I you know, I pay, I pay, I pay ten dollars a month. I expect to get all these movies eventually. That's exactly right. No, we've been, yeah, Netflix has kind of, ru- you know, ruined it, you know, going back a couple of years ago and even more so, even more so now. But, but again, it's, it's like, you've got to keep at it as many places as you can get, then freaking do it. And, you know, yeah, things have, have dropped off, but you know, there's still, I'm still, there's still sales happening on Vimeo on demand. There's still sales on iTunes. There's still sales on Amazon on, on demand. There's still, you know, ev- every place the film is placed are ge- is generating some, some revenue. So, still, even still to this day on all these films. Yeah. It, it's, you know, granted they're old, old now, so it's not tens of thousands of dollars a month, but it's absolutely on a daily basis, like you said, with your book, on a daily basis, the films are being sold somewhere. And that adds up, you know? And if, you, if something you created 10 years ago is still making you money, um, and a lot of it's pa- a lot of it obviously is passive even, right. because it's just out there in the ecosystem. Yeah, um, exactly. Right. I, that's, a, that's a win-win. And it's not going right. to a, a distributor somewhere who's smoking a cigar and going ha 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 like you know that image of that cigar that distributor it, it's it's actually money's going to you and you are controlling that revenue stream because you decided to self distribute um and also i was going to ask you how dense is this market for movies like documentaries about bike riding because i haven't seen a tremendous amount of them in my travels not in, in the cycling world. You know, I think so many, there's so much free content up on YouTube for, from, from cycling and, and, um, you know, that the extreme stuff and you know, like Red Bull is kind of got the market on the extreme side of things, um, which, uh, you know, they put a ton of stuff out for free, but, you know, with this ultra endurance, um, type stuff that, that I've put out there, it's, um, you know, there isn't that much out there. And, and I've got the mentality of, you know, this is premium, this is premium content. This is a premium story. It's got, you know, great music and tremendous emotion built into, into this storytelling. It's, it's a professionally packaged film and, and there's really no place you can watch the film, you know, for free, unless of course it was, it's on a TV network or something like that, where there's, you know, advertising on it or something like that. So pretty much every place my films are, are either rental or are transactional in nature. And, and, and you don't, you haven't gone into the AVOD world or SVOD world. Some of them have ended up there. I'm, I'm super intrigued by, by, by the AVOD type stuff. And, and that's, I'm almost worked what I'm working on right now, again, with the whole, you know, screw the gatekeepers it's like i'm actually working on building out my own bikepacking media company as you should where I'm, you know where where it's on uh, where we're going it's it's almost kind of merging you know netflix and masterclass.com for bike packers so it's going to be video content and how-to content and you know on our own apps and, and web i will i i can i can after after we get off the air i can i can guide you in this process um if i've been like. <laughs> i've been down that so the last month i've been doing tons of demos and chatting with with folks and the deeper i go into it the more my mind is absolutely being being blown so oh yeah we, we, we could talk i could i could definitely give you some whatever advice i could give you i've done, I've done sure. a little bit of it so um and I, I saw another product that you created which was and which is why i talk about in the book educational products educational mm-hmm. products are so powerful because they tap into an emotion a need of something that the audience really wants to learn about and it's when you can tap into emotion uh, of of an audience member or a customer that's when you can really make a, a difference in their life so Something like uh, which was uh, your educational product called bike back uh, bike packing secrets, which was right. sold for like eighty bucks about how to bike pack properly right. with all these stars, and it's like ten hours, something ridiculous like that. And I looked at that, I'm like, oh god, he gets it so well. Oh my god, that's just, <laughs> and it's just, and that's just, and that's all digital, so that's there's no packing because you're not packing ten hours of DVDs. Um, Dude, so, <laughs> exactly right. Yep. And yeah. it did, and it did well. It did do do well when. So with um, 
you know, it was stuff that we would put on the DVD extras, you know, how to, you know, bike pack and how, you know, the gear and whatnot. So, so then, then it was, you know, people, again, I mentioned, you know, Netflix is ruining it because people expect it, you know, to be free for, with their subscription. So the, the thesis w- was, you know, people are more willing to pay for information than they are content. So, Absolutely. so that's kind of where that came from. Let's actually package you know, in- incredible how-to information. What what became masterclass.com? So this was, you know, perhaps the precursor to when when masterclass.com kind of started doing doing their thing, and then um, you know bundled it up and, and put a, in a website together and marketed it from a strat- strat- strategy standpoint. Put um, ad dollars behind it, and and you're right. What what my production costs were probably two thousand dollars to actually go shoot this how-to content whereas so it cost nothing to 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 shoot and and create um and and there was not a whole lot of editing involved but then you know the payoff is the strategy now the strategy about how to package and marketing and putting it out into your audience right and you're feeding and you're feeding the audience what something that they really want you're giving them that and it's an audience that you've already you've already gathered them you're like you love my movies i know you like you like bike bike riding and bike packing Here's a course on how to do it properly. Here's a t-shirt because you want to represent. Here's a cool poster for your wall. And then you just start adding different product lines, different things. What other ancillary product lines did you create? Like, I mean, I'm assuming sweatshirts and t-shirts. Um, yep. What are the things that you put together? Um, t- t-shirts, sweatshirts, posters, um, DVDs, Blu-rays were the bulk of it. And then just some unique little one-off items here, here and there. Um, like we took a bunch of titanium bike tubing and chopped it up into sections and put a USB drive. So you've got a titanium bike tubing that. USB drive with a 4k version of, of the film. So, um, so I guess that's the bulk of it and, you know, mm-hmm. nothing too, you know, absolutely, absolutely crazy. And then from, from the t-shirt side of things, you know, we've, you know, use our own printer, but then also some print on demand type stuff, which, you know, did okay, but not great. Um, so I guess that's as crazy but, as we got. But then, but of course, selling credits, educational products, all <laughs> right. these other, all these are, these are all revenue streams. These are all for sure. These all the, and then you use also Kickstarter to kind of get things going for each of these projects. Yeah. So, yep, exactly. So the inspired to write film was made. So the Kickstarter for inspired to write, which went back to two, 2017 was to kind of kickstart the world premiere. And the hook was, what if I could invite the entire world to this world premiere? So we had the, you know, the athletes kind of come to Denver, Colorado. And again, back to the how to type content before the film for three or four hours, earlier that day, we put on sort of a summit. So I, I kind of had a film festival mentality. It's like, when you go to a film festival, you will you attend panels and you and you kind of have discussions about, you know, different topics. So we kind of had sort of how to um, summit type things going on throughout throughout the day um, before the film in the theater. But then we again, the whole inviting the world. So we we sold tickets to people around the world. <laughs> Um, who, could, who could attend? And this was before live streaming became, you know, oh. was a thing. I think, I think YouTube Live, you know, just started later in 2017. So we were kind of again cobbling together live events, <laughs> live streaming events, and we had actually like 40, you know, people from 40 different countries bought a ticket and tuned tuned in to to kind of the the summit that we put on. And then when the film screened, um, we did utilize VHX. So when the film screened. Everyone got their email around the, the the world to watch the film, and then at the end of the film, they could tune back into our live stream to watch the Q and A and and everything after. And that did did really well, actually. Yeah, and and um, the, 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 the a lot of times filmmakers underestimate the international market. Um, a lot, a lot. Everyone here in the states. Um, only think about oh it's just the U.S. Uh, maybe Canada, maybe the U.K. But they generally just focus on the U.S. And yes, the U.S. is a very large market. It's probably one of the largest markets. I think it still is the largest market in the world. Um, but um, take it from someone who's got an international podcast um, um, and sells products, digital products online all the time. International is huge. 
And there's so many people who, imagine if you're living in Nepal, um, <laughs> and I've had it, and they just like, I want to tune in and watch this. Like, because there's no way I'll ever get to go to this thing. I can't afford it. It's just the other side of the world. But for 50 bucks or whatever, 30 bucks, I can t log in and watch it. That is so powerful. Absolutely. Yep. And, you're, and you're, you're absolutely and you, right. And, and I'm assuming there's bike riders all over the world. <laughs> absolutely. And yeah, UK is is a big market for us. Yeah. Yeah. Europe and UK in particular has been huge. Now, did you um, did you ever approach any promotional partners to help you market or sell this, like bike shops or bike brands or anything like that? Some brands. You know, it was, you know, again, you know, difficult to get a lot of brands to, to say yes. Some brands have have said yes, but yeah, I think it's just, you know, a lot like trying to go out and find an investor for your indie film or, or again, trying to get into, into a, a festival or something. Dude, there's still a ton of no's, even though, even though I've kind of got the three films, you know, that have done well, it's like, I can't call up specialized and, and, you know, say, Oh yeah, Mike, here, here here's, now we're going to throw you $50,000 for your next project. I, I still don't have that. And, you know, perhaps haven't put the, the same amount of energy, you know, energy into it th that I should have, but it's still a struggle. And, and perhaps, you know, I don't know where we kind of are going with this, but I'm, I'm still, you know, the direct to consumer. It's like, I would much rather put my time and energy into, again, using the frame surprise and delight thousands of, of people who appreciate, I would much rather try to pre-sale $25,000 worth of my next thing to this audience who I have put the time and energy into than trying, you know, of course, if a sponsor is going to throw me money, great, but it's still a struggle there, you know, to get a, a yes is difficult. Yeah. It, with, uh, the, hustle, the hustle is real, sir. The hustle is real. You always, always <laughs> hustling, man, always hustling. Now, um, now we talked a little bit about, you've mentioned it a couple times, RTD 10. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so Ride the Divide had its 10-year anniversary last year. So kind of in the middle of, of the pandemic, you know, we kind of put um, a virtual event together to kind of celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the film and and brought some some OGs in from sort of the Divide bikepacking sort of world and, 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 and kind of did a cool sort of three, four-hour, again, sort of interview type, type thing. And then, then we watched, you know, kind of the film with a lot of the – the people, athletes who were part of the original Ride, Ride the Divide. And then as part of, again, with bundling, it's like the tickets were were $10, but you could also then um, order, again, to the pre-order, an RTD-10 bundle, which was a new version of the RTD-10 film with a new poster and, and new packaging. So we're actually working on, on that right now, which is going to be... So RTD 10 is going is is Ride the Divide's 10 year anniversary box set, and it's and I'm still working on what's going to be inside the box set. But there's only going to be a thousand of them uh, ever created. So you know, like the po official movie poster will be one of a thousand, two of a thousand hand hand number, and then probably some some new physical items and T-shirts. And and this is where you know getting some brands on board. Hey brands, do you want to you know send us a thousand? of something that we could put into this box set bundle. Um, so that's kind of where, what we're working on. And what right is that going to retail for? Just out of curiosity. The, it'll probably be $125 for this, this box set bundle. Is so, kind of where, where it's so 125 bucks times a thousand. That's not bad, man. <laughs> that's pretty good. I mean, and then, yeah. And then it's a it's a new version of the film. So we so the film is back in the edit bay. So we're telling the same story, mm -hmm. but anywhere from twenty five to forty percent of the footage will be different. So potentially new music and and new scenes and new stories because yeah. we we ended up with one hundred and seventy hours of footage from sure from, you know yeah. covering the event. So so now it's it's like it's the same story, but you're seeing new, new unique scenes and, and things awesome. that happened, which then I think could really inspire people to like go back and watch the original to see what's different and, and how it is told different. And then it's also a new film that ends up on iTunes and all the other platforms. So, and we get to go hopefully pandemic permitting some, some live events and back to our whole sort of uh, what we do. That's amazing, man. Uh, again, it's been such a, 
just such a pleasure talking to you, man, and talking to someone who gets it. Uh, before we get go, before we get, uh, before we finish, I, I want to ask you a few questions to ask all my guests. Uh, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Break into the business. You said the word of the hustle is real, man. It's like hustle. Get on the phone, network, make connections. Um, you know, do what you can do. Gosh, it, dude, and anymore, it's like again, this freaking iPhone. You know, I'm <laughs> I'm holding. I just saw that DJI just came out with a brand new freaking drone that that you know it fits in your hand to to get aerials. It's like you can go create whatever the no whatever you want. So um, just get out there and do it. Hustle, make. Yeah, exactly. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Man, I don't know. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> a tough one. Um, gosh, the longest. I don't know. It's, hit hit the next one. Let's come back to that one. Three of your favorite films of all time. Uh, freaking Lost Boys. Just so and, good, so good. Going, it's like I was in. I would date <laughs> myself, but dude, that came out when I was was in college, and and it was like a, a midnight screening of of Lost Boys, and God, we were just drunk and you know having a crazy time up in the balcony watching Lost Boys, and and then you know bought the DVD of that film and just watched it over and over and over again. Um, Can I tell you my Lost Boy story? Yes, please. Okay, okay. first, so, so first of all, Lost Boys, arguably the coolest vampires of all time. Um, cinema, cinematic vampires, near dark, pretty close to it, but um, but they would arguably the coolest looking, they're just coolest vampires. Um, a buddy of mine was an actor in Lost Boys Two, not the one they made, the direct, the direct sequel that didn't get finished. They shot footage, but never finished it. Uh -huh. So this is the story. The story was that you remember when Kiefer Sutherland got impaled, right? Well, mm -hmm. he, he didn't like blow up or sparkle um, or <laughs> or something. Um, sorry, did you hear the tone in my voice when I said sparkle? <laughs> um, you know, he 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 didn't blow up or anything. So he's in like the in the coroner's office, and they pull the they pull the horns out, and he comes back to life. So that's how they were going to start the whole thing and then he was going to and then all his guys I think some of his guys actually did blow up but he didn't so he would then he just breaks out of the thing and he just starts grabbing the first people and starts vamping out on them to build up his crew one my buddy was going to be one of those vampires they shot a bunch of scenes uh, and then um, like I think a week into it someone uh, one of the, the director walks up to everybody uh, and like um we are, we're, uh, announcement everybody, we're closing down the production because Mr. Sutherland has decided to uh, move on to another project instead. And that was young, and he went on to do Young Guns. Uh, he wanted to go do Young Guns instead of Lost Boys 2. So we never got to see a Lost Boys 2. Uh, I don't even know if Joel Schumacher was directing it or not, but that is the story. That is a little tidbit, a little Lost Boys that's, trivia. <laughs> that's amazing. I had no freaking clue. And I remember my first time, in, in Santa Santa Cruz going, holy crap, this is Santa Clara, man. I'm, I'm, I, this is the bridge that they were hanging from. So, <laughs> All right, anyways, so the other two, other two. I don't know. I think Lost Boys, you know, that whole discussion covered, you know, number two and number three as well. Fair so. enough, fair enough. Uh, and do you want to go back to that other question or just let it go? <sighs> Say it again, rephrase it. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Dude, yeah. I, I think I've always had the mentality of, of, you know, don't burn your bridges. Yeah. And I think that's just, <laughs> yeah. you know, holds, holds so true. And of course I, I've made, I've probably burned, you know, a bridge or two um, <laughs> in my time, but man, I think that is, fucked. don't burn your bridges. You know, I, I, ever, I, I had a running gag with a lot of the guys I used to work with who were working in my my VFX company, and they're like, "Alex, you don't nuke bridges. You don't you don't burn bridges. You nuke bridges." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, that's a it's a thing." I, and 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 when you're younger, you do things like that, but as you get older, you start realizing how small this business really is. And from someone who talks to people on a daily basis, interviews and stuff, I'll talk like, "Look, you know Kia. I know Kia. There's like, and it's if you and I just met." 
oh, I know Keo, you know, it's, and, and if you screwed, if I screwed Keo over, or you screwed, you see what I mean? It's so, it's such a small business, and that's something that filmmakers really need to understand. They think it's huge. It is not. It is a very, very small. Even these big guys who I talk to sometimes on the show, who are very established filmmakers and big, you know, big making $200 million movies, they'll start talking about like, oh, this guy connected me. I'm like, oh, really? He connected that other guy too. And oh, he's like, it's just fascinating how small the business is. And it gets smaller on a daily basis. It's pretty great. So that's great advice. Don't burn your bridges. Um, now, Mike, it's been a pleasure talking to you, brother. Where can people find you and uh, everything that you're doing? Probably, you know, the easiest, gosh, I don't, you know, MikeDion.com is a freaking really old website. I haven't updated it forever, but there's some contact um, information in there. Uh, the new project, RTD10.com, um, is a place to kind of go. That website will evolve and change as the project kind of goes through its uh, evolution over the next three to three to six months. Um, if you want to check out sort of the, the Shopify site, InspiredToRide.it is is that site's done, you know, incredible amounts of revenue from that site. So if you want to see a site that's kind of one of those direct-to-consumer sites that's actually generated some great revenue, you could check inspiredtoride.it out. Mm -hmm. um, hit me up on LinkedIn if you want to talk biz. That's great. And I'll put all those, I'll put those links in the show notes. Mike, man, thank you again for coming on the show, man. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to someone who gets it, who's been doing it. You're an OG in the film entrepreneur space, sir. So I appreciate that. Appreciate your time. <laughs>